The problem is nobody knows what the whole modification process is. It's all just too blurry. So there's no consistency. A lot of the payers don't know what to ask for or what they need. And so that's where we're going to be coming in and organizing it because it's just too, nobody really knows what's going on right now, which is, thank God for for you, Dr. Russell, as far as trying to make this more of a process and make it more clear cut because not only do people not know what occupational therapy is, at least not in the United States the way they should, but they absolutely have no idea what process home modification should go through and who should do it. And that's part of the reason that we're doing that this group was formed because in the United States anyway, people were looking at the builders as the leaders for home modifications and there's not a, there was not a lot of money for OT and there's not a lot of recognition. But you know, it's part of pulling, you know, this is an emerging field and pulling it together so that people do understand what it is. Yeah, I think we've got the same problem here in the UK in terms of builders and architects doing what our role is. So I think obviously it's not just specific to the US. I think it's probably similar um, here, Europe, Australia. Um, yeah. So I think the work that you're doing is really important. Yeah, I feel like if if we don't pull together and you know, be, make ourselves leaders because nobody's going to give us a place at the table. We're going to yeah. have to pull up a chair and elbow our way in. But if we don't yeah. do this, then um, then we're out of the game, which is why, you know, I'm so glad that you're doing the research that you are doing. Yeah, thank you. Well, hopefully it'll be if so. Well, and maybe I would, if it's all right with you, that you just caught the end yeah. of the evaluation committee because um, we are working on developing an evaluation. We've got access to technology company that's going to be developing the app for us. But, you know, one thing, I don't know if you were part of that discussion was how, uh, how can we put together this app so it also collects the data that the occupational therapists that are doing the research how can we collect the data you need? You know, whether it's yeah, I think yeah, yeah, I think I think it's really interesting, um, and hopefully we'll talk about outcomes. I think the challenge that we have got in terms of measuring outcomes is that different audiences yeah. want different outcomes to be measured. So obviously, as practitioners, we want to look at the outcomes in terms of probably the improvement people's health and well-being, occupational performance and participation, commissioners or um, um, whoever is buying in your service is probably interested in other metrics that um, that outcome measures that we're more familiar with isn't necessarily what they're wanting um, but then it's about advising um commissioners and people who buy our service actually what what do they want measuring um so i think it's quite challenging in terms of outcome measures and measuring why you're measuring um, um so yeah i think it's really cha challenging and i think it's about just being aware of what outcome measures are out there knowing what they do measure and then almost kind of having a basket of outcome measures that you can depending on what audience that you're looking at targeting. Good point. I would imagine most of it would be, and we've already got some um, research about, you know, lowering health care costs, readmissions yeah. is a big thing here in the United States. Caregiver hours. Yeah. But then it's about linking it up to, is it the occupational therapist? making that difference which we know we know it is but th there's there's very little research that goes on in, in terms of if you look at occupational therapy in the body of evidence and you think about other areas of occupational therapy research there's very little done in this this field um obviously you guys have got susie stark over there you've got laura gitlin um in the in the UK, we've got we are just about getting a few more researchers interested. But for a long time, 
we really only had Francis Haywood. I don't know if any of you have come across Francis Haywood's work. Uh, in in Australia now, you've got people like Tammy Applin, Liz Ainsworth, um, that's doing a bit of research. And obviously, you've got the guys in Sweden, Susan Erson and her colleagues at Lund University. But in terms of a body of evidence, it's not huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully we can uh, we can change that. I know in the United States they're making it so you have to have a doctorate in order to practice occupational therapy. So I would assume there's going to be more and more people looking for research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, thank you for coming and thanks for jumping into that conversation, Rachel. No worries. Um, let me introduce you real quick. Thank you, all. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, Dr. Russell, thank you so much for coming. She's going to be talking today about the home modification process and how to make the invisible visible. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about Dr. Russell. Dr. Russell is a lecturer of occupational therapy. I got this over the front of my thing, and a research assistant at at the Surface Research Center. As part of her research work, she's undertaken a PhD, which is considering how OTs can use building and construction processes to improve the clinical effectiveness of what they do. And so, without further ado, welcome Rachel and welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. I, I appreciate that. We all do. No worries. Uh, I do apologise for that. You've had to change the time, but it's it's. You probably realise it's eleven o'clock in the UK. Oh. So if I do fall asleep, I do apologise. <laughs> I will wake you up. <laughs> do you want me to share my screen? Can I share my screen? Yes. Yet? Let's do that. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. I was reading a comment That's someone that? just sent to me and not paying attention the way I should. That's all right. Oops, just a second. And then for those of you who don't know, my name's Karen Cook. I'm an occupational therapist in the United States, Michigan in particular. And um, I have a couple of home modification companies. One is completely occupational therapy and design, and the other one is construction company. Perfect. So welcome, everyone. And please take notes, Gail. Right. Uh, is my screen being shared now, Karen? Yes, we can see it. Brilliant. I'm just trying to put it onto the... Right, okay. Karen, did you manage to circulate the documents that I sent round that I, I emailed to LA? I, I got one document that told who you were. It said draft on the front of it. Yep. And so I just wrote that, what you had in that document in the um, email that I sent out to the group. All right, okay. Okay, um, I have two documents. Um, so I've, because I did send Ellie some bits and pieces and I'm sure we can, um, we can send you around a copy of the PowerPoint, um, also a glossary of terms um, that just explain some of the terms that I've used in the process, because some of those terms might be a little bit unfamiliar. Um, and I've got another couple of other documents as well that we can circulate as well as the protocol. Um, so hopefully we can circulate that to everybody that, that's here this evening. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll kick off. Hopefully I'll be about an hour, an hour and a half, maybe just going through the presentation. Um, but as um, my research has been focused around developing a, um, a process for what we do as occupational therapists within this field of practice. I think a lot of what we do currently is, is invisible to those that we're working with particularly our building colleagues so architects and builders don't always fully understand kind of the clinical reasoning uh, that goes on in our head um, so what the process protocol is really doing is just making that side of our practice more visible um, so i'm just trying to get this to click through okay so just in terms of what you'll take away from 
uh, the session this evening is hopefully um, you'll be able to explain um, to your housing and your architect colleague occupational therapists need to be involved in the multiple phases that are involved in conducting a home modification. Hopefully you'll have an understanding of how I use the occupational therapy intervention process model to develop uh, the protocol. So hopefully what you'll get a sense of is that this is very much a process that's been developed that's underpinned by um, the theory of what we do in terms of occupational therapy. I'll take you through the different, the multiple phases of the home modification process protocol as well uh, towards the end of the session. And hopefully you'll be able to describe the things that you need to do and the decisions that you need to make as, a, as an occupation during the, the many phases of uh, designing and constructing a home modification. And hopefully we'll get a chance to think about the opportunities of, of challenges of using the home modification practice, uh, sorry, protocol in your own area of practice. So what I've done is I've just split the webinar into five parts. So I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, obviously, Karen's introduced, uh, already introduced me, but just to kind of give you a little bit of background in, t in terms of who I am. In part two, I'm going to talk a little bit about theory um, of what we do as just a reminder of um, why we have got a role in terms of improving people's health and well-being through housing adaptations. And I think it's always good to kind of go back and think about what we contribute in terms of people's health and well-being um, when we're involved in this field of practice. Um, I'll talk very briefly about how I actually came to develop the home modification process protocol and it, that it wasn't just something that I've plucked out of the air. Uh, the air. Um, and then I'll walk you through the, um, the, the process protocol itself. As I say, um, I will send Karen and Ellie copies um, that you'll be able to hopefully access, or you can always email me and I can and can send you those bits and pieces through. And then finally, we'll just think about implications for, for practice. Um, so that's me up in the left-hand corner there. I live in a place called Haworth. Um, some of you, I don't know if any of you are into um, your literary um, reading, uh, but Haworth is where the Bronte sisters are from. So if anybody's read Wuthering Heights, um, uh, so I live in the village that the Bronte sisters live in. Haworth is around 40 miles from Manchester. So that's probably the um, city that you may have heard of in the UK. So we're in the north of England and um, topographically we live in quite a challenging area. So this picture in the centre um, is typical housing around in Haworth and what you can actually see here is what we called overdwellings. Um, so there's actually two houses on top of each other because uh, it's so steep around this part of uh, the UK. Before I uh, joined the Ivory Tower of Academia, I was a community occupational therapist for 20 odd years um, and my role was within a social care setting. Uh, so um, my main job was obviously working with people in their own homes and looking at ways in which we can modify their home environment to make them um, to make it more accessible to enable them to do the things that they want, need and have to do. Um, I always mention that because um, I think sometimes when you you, you say you're 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 a, a you're an academic, people think that you you perhaps aren't in touch with the real world. So I always like to mention that you know I I did practice as an occupational therapist uh, in the field of housing adaptations for a long time before I went into to academia. Um, the reason I've got this picture down here is I don't know about anybody else, but certainly when I was a practitioner, um, I always had with very complex cases, that sensation of waking up at two o'clock in the morning um, just before the builders were about to go on site to do a thinking, have I done everything? You know, have, have the builders information? Have I assessed the person in the right way? Is it gonna gonna meet their needs? And in terms of um, occupational therapy, we've got very 
very few tools out there that kind of support our practice. Um, so in terms of when I moved into academia, I think, you know, for me, it was about developing and doing research around um, supporting occupational therapy practice, looking at what we did and the process of, of um, adapting people's homes. Um, and as Karen mentioned, I'm now at the University um, and um, although I do a little bit of research, uh, my main role is as a, as a lecturer at, at Salford, uh, training the occupational therapists um, at Salford. So that's just to give you a kind of background as to who I am. <clears throat> okay, so the theory bit. Um, I don't know if you just want to quickly think about you know, in terms of your own practice, what theoretical model influences your practice? Is it the PEO model? Um, is it the um, PEOM model? Or is it the OTIPM? Is it Cower? Is it MOHO, CMOP? Or are you like most practitioners in the UK where actually, to be honest, you trained so long ago that you really don't have a clue as to which model that you use? So you tend to say that you use the eclectic model of occupational therapy in any way actually why does does theory really matter um, for my research i've used the occupational therapy uh, intervention performance model which um, is was developed by Anne fisher who i, I believe is an american occupational therapist um, and she um, developed the AMPS um, assessment tool. So if you've heard of AMPS, you'll have heard of OTIPM. So usually when I talk to students and I mention theory, there's usually a glazed look um, and, um, you know, you know, why is theory important is usually what we hear from the students. Um, so the reason theory is important is because when we're working with our building colleagues, and architect colleagues, this is often what they see. They see that three, 2D CAD drawing. Please don't ask me why I've positioned the person right at the back of uh, the toilet here. I'm not quite sure what I was thinking, but this is what they see. They see, you know, that 2D CAD drawing. They see the fixtures and fittings. <clears throat> Whereas for us occupational therapists, this is, is exactly the same bathroom that I've just shown you. But what we see because of our kind of the theories that under, uh, underpin our profession, we don't just see a 2D, don't just see space. What we see is a space that is about, you know, leisure. So right at the back there, um, on the windowsill, you can see my husband's um, reading material that he usually takes into the loo. Obviously, it's a space where personal cat tasks take place. So obviously, you know, the, the reason you've got the sink there um, is for cleaning teeth and carrying out those personal care tasks. But it's also a bathroom is a really important space for play. I know as a working mum, um, the bathroom in terms of getting home on a night and spending time with my son who's now who's that's Alfie that's sat on the the um, toilet system there he's now 10 he's actually 10 on Wednesday so he has grown up quite a bit since this photograph was taken but certainly as a working mum that's a really important space for me on an evening uh, when Alfie was little in terms of engaging with him and playing with him obviously for Alfie and it was you know when he was growing up in those early stages it was in terms of play again that's was a really important space in terms of his his development but we also got to think about that actually somebody's got to clean the bathroom as well so um you know it is a space in terms of you know somebody has to clean it in terms of rituals and habits um you know that that our rituals and habits shape the space that we um uh inhabit so you can see here alfie's ritual when he was uh, uh, smaller was he always ha had a habit of sitting on the loo to clean his teeth not quite sure what that says about me as a mother but um, you know that was his ritual and habit and you know you think about your own home and how your home looks and how it's being shaped by your own ritual and habits and also culturally um, you know culturally how uh, culture religion etc etc shapes the space that we use so our bathrooms here in the UK and I'm sure in the states look a certain way in terms of culturally 
go to eastern um, countries, Asian countries, your bathrooms are going to look very different because of, of uh, you know, just culturally they they look different. Um, and you know, I, I like showing this picture because I'm sure that the guy who designed that toilet never thought that it would be used in the way that Alfie used the bathroom and used the loo. And I think, you know, as occupational therapists, what we recognise because we are person centred is that we take on board and we, you know, we want to understand how people use that space. And, and that's what our theory does, isn't it? That's that our theory and our education as occupational therapists um, has shaped our understanding of how people use space. So just a reminder of how the built environment influences occupational, uh, occupational performance participation. So most generic models of occupational therapy practice identify that the built aspects of the um, environment including your ho the home influence how we perform and participate in occupations. So the way that your home is designed influences how well or um, how not so well you, you're able to do the everyday things that have meaning and importance to you. What those generic models also uh, imply is that we can use design and construction methods um, to, um, to um, maintain, restore or acquire occupational performance skills or uh, participation. So when you're working with architects and you're looking at design and construction, that's basically what you're doing is that you're using those techniques to maintain, restore or enable somebody to acquire occupational performance skills or participation. Um, hopefully this is all making sense. If it's not, I'm sure Karen will kind of uh, shout out if people are putting bits and pieces in the chat box. OK, so just moving on. So I've pinched this. This is taken from Branton Pope. It's quite an old um, um, way of kind of visualising what we do. And Branton Pope are uh, researchers in the US, so some this might actually be quite familiar to you guys, um, but I think this is quite a good way of visualising and trying to explain to non-occupational therapists about what we do when we're using home modifications. So what you've got on the left hand side is you, you've got somebody who's living in their own home environment and that home environment is supporting their health and well-being. But then something happens, there's a disablement process, so that might be through injury, a long term condition or even a temporary condition. But something happens, which means that that person's needs, their health and well-being can no longer be met by that person's home environment. And obviously, as occupational therapists, we're often thinking about people's ability to do those everyday activities that they want, need and have to do. But then what we can do as occupational therapists is that we can do um, some enablement. So that might be enablement in terms of functional restoration. So that might be in terms of medication, not necessarily occupational therapists, uh, but we might as occupational therapists be involved in rehabilitation or re-enablement. Or what we do in this field of practice is home modifications. One of the main differences between the US and Europe and the UK is that um, we use the term housing adaptations rather than home modifications. Um, and for us, home modification, and I know this is similar to Australia as well, we tend to refer uh, to home modifications as um, alterations um, to the home environment, whereas in the US, um, I've, I've, um, I've been over to meet Susie Stark, and I know um, from what Susie says, you tend to have a more broader definition of what you, you term as home modification, so you also include um, 
changing the way people do things or it could be assistive technology so in the UK Australia and Europe we tend to have a more uh, narrow definition of, of what we mean by home modifications but I get the feeling in terms of what you guys are doing in the home modification OT Alliance is probably very similar to what we do in the UK Australia in terms of adapting people's homes so that's kind of those structural changes um, etc but I, I always show this slide because i think this is a really simple way for non-occupational therapists to understand what we're doing so with home modifications we're really not necessarily changing too much about the person but we're um we're getting a better fit in terms of the home environment to support to support that person's health and well-being Whereas in terms of functional restoration, we're not really changing that home environment. We're actually changing the person. OK, so. So just a reminder about, OK, we're, when we're making these structural changes, what impact does it have on occupational performance and participation? So when we're adapting uh, or modifying people's homes, we're perhaps thinking about how we can enhance the, the person's capability. So how, you know, perhaps with a lever tap, you're enhancing somebody's motor um, capabilities, changing the lighting, maybe enhance it, enhancing somebody, somebody's sensory uh, capabilities. So, yeah, one of the things that we're doing when we're modifying the home environment is thinking about how we can enhance the person's capabilities. We also might be reducing the demands of the environment. So if somebody has, um, you know, is in a wheelchair um, and the space is quite tight, we may be uh, creating larger spaces. So we're reducing the demands of the environment. And I've just highlighted there the different ways in which we might reduce the demands of the environment through modifying the home environment. Yeah. Um, or we might be thinking about how we reduce the demands of, of the task. Um, so, you know, changing the environment so the frequency that somebody has to perform a task is less. We might be designing the environment so in terms of the number of steps and sequences involved in an activity is reduced or we might be reducing the strain for the carer um, and we might just be making more efficient use of the environment so once again I think that's just I just kind of really want to kind of highlight actually what it is that we're doing when we're modifying uh, people's home environments and what we're trying to achieve when we're when we're thinking about improving people's occupational performance and participation. OK, so hopefully that's a, a useful reminder of the fantastic work that you're all doing out there. So what I just want to kind of say right kind of early on in 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 the presentation is I think one of the things when I was practicing as as uh, as an occupational therapist, or as I still do, is that I always thought this was the outcome of what I did as an occupational therapist, or it, this was my intervention rather. Uh, you know, the actual adaptation or the at the actual modification was what I did as you know, but actually that's just the outcome of my intervention. Actually, when I'm when I'm modifying somebody's home this is what the intervention is that I'm doing it's actually the process of designing and being involved in the construction of the and the modification that's my intervention not that is just the outcome of what I've done you know if I was to, to describe my intervention this is it it's the process that I used in terms of designing and constructing the adaptation um, and I think that's one of the kind of key messages that I want you to take home this evening is that is the outcome of what you do. And it's the outcome of this, that process of your involvement in the design and support in the construction of the adaptation. So just to kind of um, say why I reached the, you know, why I looked at research education um, process well um, when you do any type of research you always have you, you have to do a laborious task of looking at what the literature and evidence um, and what became really clear 
clear early on in um, my research was that although there is a body of evidence that talks about the fantastic work that we do as occupational therapists, there is also a body of evidence that has been quite critical in terms of the process that we have used at times of as occupational therapists when modifying the home environment. One of the uh, criticisms there has been is that we certainly in the UK have had a tendency as occupational therapists to con concentrate on accessibility rather than usability. So for example, the way that I illustrate this is um, I can make a toilet facilities um, accessible to you by providing you with a commode. Um, I'm not, I, I, I apologise if I use terms that aren't familiar to you, but I, I assume you know what I mean by commode. Now, yes, that I am making toilet facilities accessible to you, but actually, as a human being, in terms of your dignity, etc., actually, how usable is that for you? Actually, it would be far better if we looked at a downstairs. Um, um, toilet facilities or a stair lift to get you upstairs. So it's about thinking, yeah, as I say, one of the criticisms is that we tend to focus on accessibility rather than actually how usable is that space. And usability is in the eye of the beholder. It's not for me to say how usable the environment is that is something that the person that I'm working with will tell me whether a particular solution is something that is acceptable and is going to be something that they're going to want to use. The other uh, criticism that has been made is that we have at times failed to take a collaborative approach so you know, as occupational therapists, we often talk about being client centred or person centred. But actually, what the evidence says is that at times, actually, we don't always collaborate effectively and that people can find it. The people that we're working with, the older and disabled people that we're working with can at times find the whole process quite confusing. Um, so if you think about the CAD drawings, the computer aided design drawings, the, particularly the 2D drawings, you know, I've been doing this job a long time and I still have difficulty looking at a plan of a modification scheme and being able to look at 2D plan and then being able to visualise what that will look like. And yet we're expecting people who are not familiar with um, CAD drawings and modification plans to be able to think, actually, that's going to that's that's going to work for me. One of the things that I always say to students and, and to um, architects and to um, people like yourselves is that as an occupational therapist, I think this field of practice is one of the most invasive um, interventions that you can actually do with somebody. You are actually changing the fabric of somebody's home. You're actually changing the meaning of somebody's home. And if you look at the work that Tammy Applin has done in, in Australia in terms of meaning of home, you know, the impact that that can have on somebody psychologically. And, you know, if we're not collaborating, if people aren't making informed decisions about how the home is being adapted, you know, from an ethical point of view, are we doing our jobs? So that's just something to think about in terms of actually what you're doing, modifying people's homes. Yes, it may just be sticking a grab rail in, but actually, potentially, that is a really invasive thing that you're doing. And you've got to make sure that you are collaborating, that the person is fully informed in terms of what you are doing to their home environment. You wouldn't expect a surgeon to carry out surgery on you if you didn't fully understand what the consequences might be. Um, and sometimes I don't always think we provide that same level of information in terms of what we're doing um, with with people. Um, a 
Panus, who I presume some of you will have heard of because he um, is based in the US, he talks about home modification services being a patchwork of services. This is very true in the uh, in the UK, as I'm sure, as obviously is in um, in the US. Um, and if we've got some Australian colleagues, I'm sure it's the same in Australia. It's a patchwork of service services. You have got a number of professionals potentially involved in particularly big complex adaptations. And I'm thinking particularly for children, there can be numerous professionals involved. You could have the architect, you be, could be liaising with the social worker, you could be liaising with family, carers. Plus it's a field of practice that covers both health as well as architect and building. So you're bringing two quite diverse professions together. And, you know, we in the, you know, we're, we're health professionals and we speak a very different language to our housing and architect colleagues. And it's about actually trying to find that middle ground where you both understand, um, you know, you, you understand where the builder and architect is coming from in terms of the process that they've got to go through and being able to communicate, you know, um, what you're doing as the occupational therapist. I know I have, you know, at times builders have got absolutely exasperated with me over the debates around where we should fit a, a grab rail. And it's about them understanding that if you, you know, if you're only a few centimetres out in terms of where you put that grab rail, it could have huge impact in terms of whether that adaptation is going to going to work for them. So that's one of the other criticism that's been made about this field of practice is that the patchwork of services you know the process isn't clear um, and it's all very confusing to the person that we're working with the older disabled person one of the things that Haywood has said is that a poor home modification pro process leads to an adaptation that does not provide that right fit so if we're thinking about back to that model I showed you earlier you know Yes, you might modify the home, but if you've not followed the right process, then you're not going to get an adaptation that provides that right fit. At worst, it could result uh, in financial waste. I'm looking back on my career, I can think about the number of times I've gone back in and think, oh, we should have done that differently. Um, and perhaps the financial waste that that might have incurred when we've had to go back and reposition bits and pieces. And at worst, it's the potential harm physically and psychologically when we don't adapt people's houses or modify the house in, in the right way. So at the start of my research, um, I did an online questionnaire because what, what I wanted to do was actually understand why there was potentially this problem with the, uh, the process that we were using as occupational therapists. So I've just taken a, a swig of Diet Coke to keep me awake. Um, so I did an online questionnaire and it was a mixture of open and closed questions and it was UK based. Um, and I had about 135 respondents. What was what was the key finding from that survey was that there was no kind of clear um, description of their role in the home modification process. Um, and when you looked at how they described the process, what they tended to use was they did an assessment of need um, and that tends to link back to our legislation here back in, in the UK. Um, but when you unpicked what they were talking about in terms of this assessment of need or evaluation of need was that they were describing um, and they were combining the evaluation, the goal setting, the solution planning, part of the OT process, but they were just calling it, oh, my role is about assessing the need and making recommendations for the um you know for the modification um so we had this problem there was no clear role in terms of what they saw their role you know they there wasn't a, um, a consistent uh, definition or description of the ot process in the design and construction of adaptations 
I was really fortunate doing my PhD because I actually did it within the School of the Built Environment at Salford University. So I, I, I was outside of, of kind of occupational therapy. And that was really helpful because it enabled me to look at um, um, and immerse myself in design and construction theories. So I was able to look at what the design and con construction industry was doing and what was really interesting was back in the 1980s and 1990s in the UK and I'm sure this was very similar in the US and Australia was that um, they had very similar problems to occupational therapists in terms of there were many professions this we're talking about big major uh, construction projects now there were many different disciplines involved in these big complex um, projects. Um, there was no clear processes to, you know, what should be done and 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 when. And that they also recognised that actually the, the, the process was really complex. So what they did was that they developed a number of standardised processes to help manage their practice. So a lot of research went on in the 1990s in the UK in terms of design and construction industry, and they developed a number of these standardised processes. And what these processes were about was collecting the right type of information at the right time and then using that information to design and construct buildings that met the needs of the people that were going to be using those buildings and that's what was that that last bit is key so at the forefront of the process was actually at the end of what we're doing we want to build a you know a building um, that is going to meet those the, the the needs of the people who are going to be using the building but to do that we need to start off by collecting the right information collecting that information at the right time and using the information so that we build and construct um, projects that meet people's needs so kind of my conclusion at, at, at the end of doing that survey was actually what we need as practitioners no matter where you practice whether you're in the US you're in Scandinavia or you're in Australia what we need is an occupation focused design and construction process that helps you as practitioners collect the right information at the right time and to help you to use that information so that you can support the design and construction of home modifications and really importantly is that their home modification that meets the needs of the people that are going to use them so that's what i kind of concluded at the end of, of that that first bit of research so how did i go about moving on to part three how did i go on about developing the protocol itself well i didn't just pluck it out of my brain honestly what I did is I took the questionnaire data because I collected lots of data in that questionnaire and I combined it with the occupational therapy intervention process model and I kind of combined it with one of these standardised um, uh, construction uh, processes and if you want to go away and read up on the particular protocol that I looked at it was the generic design and construction process protocol so by taking the OTIPA model our OT model and by combining it with a generic design and construction process that's how I came up with the home modification process protocol um, I just want to show this slide because I really like the OTIPA um, in terms of um, conceptually how it looks at uh, occupational performance and for me as somebody that works in home adaptations or home modifications um, it really speaks to me um, so it's kind of a little bit of a PEO model um, I don't Karen can you see my can you see my mouse or can you not see my mouse Yeah, I can see it. I think. Yeah, we oh, can. brilliant. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, so what I like about it is, is it, it, it speaks to me as, as an occupational therapist in this field of uh, practice because it talks about things like task demands. It 
gets you to think about what you know when you're doing a task what kind of space do you need what tools etc it talks about you know when you, you you know the the person factors and body fact body functions that you need to think about and then it talks about environmental demand so you know what is the environment like that is existing so I really like it because it kind of speaks to me as an occupational therapist working in this field of, of practice so I just wanted to show you that just so that you have um, a little bit of an understanding of, of the conceptual model of how we how the OTIPM looks at occupational performance participation the other really lovely thing about the OTIPM is that it also has a, um, a process as well, an, an OT process linked to it, um, which I won't go into a lot of detail, yeah, but sure. um, um, so you've got evaluation and goal setting, it's got an intervention phase and a re-evaluation re phase. Again, in the UK, um, I'm not quite sure about Australia for you guys that are from Australia if anybody is listening from Australia um, we tend to talk about assessment and reassessment whereas uh, in the US you talk about evaluation um, but anyway that's just an aside right time's marching on so let me just take you through the um, home modification process protocol as I said um, either Karen or if you want to contact me I will send you a copy of the protocol itself um, I'll just flick back so I can just give you a visual of what it looks like sorry about this I'm probably sending you all dizzy now so that's what the process protocol looks like um, so it's got um, at the top the different phases of design and construction and I'm going to go into a lot into a lot more detail but I just wanted to go back to this so that visually overall you have an understanding of what it looks like so just to go back sorry about this nearly there bear with me okay nearly there there we go okay right so there are Along that top line, there are four phases that link to assessment of, you guys will know it as evaluation, intervention planning, intervention and evaluation or re-evaluation. And within the four phases, there are nine sub-phases and I'm going to go through those sub-phases in a minute. OK, so I've broken those four phases down into nine sub-phases. So for each of the subphases, there is, is a description. There are key questions that you ask yourself. There, there are actions that you need to take at each phase. And there is an indication of what the outcome of each phase is. And one of the things that um, kind of working on our tools to assist with each phase so kind of clinical reasoning or professional reasoning tools that support you at each phase or outcome measures that you can use at different phases okay i'll just go back so what as i say what what the protocol is about is is getting you to collect that right information at the right time and to get you to use that information in the right way to help you be involved in the design and construction of a home modification that's going to be right for hopefully for the individual that you're working with because it combines design and construction it it uses terms that incorporate terms that will be familiar with your architect colleagues um, and hopefully that will become clear as i say when we either Karen or myself if you email me I'll send you a glossary of terms that explain some of these terms that may not be as familiar with you um, because as I say I've used the OTIPM terms as well okay so under assessment we have three stages or sub phases zero to two so this is your evaluation um, element of the process okay so it might seem a bit peculiar that there is a sub phase zero. 
The reason that there is a subphase zero is if you work with uh, designers or architects, they will often have a conversation with a client that is about saying, is this approach, is you know this project the right project, um, is you know doing a new build the right thing, is modifying your home the right thing and that's why there is a subphase zero because often what we do when people ring you as an occupational therapist you will have that initial conversation to get a sense of actually is a home modification going to be the right thing or actually do you need or is it actually better to look at some other intervention perhaps some rehabilitation so that is why there is a subphase zero it's that initial kind of contact with the person is this going to be the right thing for you in terms of modifying the home what we don't want to do is start working with somebody and actually you know three visits on you kind of realize that actually it's not the right thing and only if you'd had that conversation earlier you would have saved them and yourself time and money so that's why there's a sub say sub phase zero so the key questions you're asking here is you know why is the person contacted you you know you know is modifying the home going to be the right thing for that situation and also is the person aware of the limitations within your practice setting so there may be some limitations in terms of your experience um, certainly in the UK there are limitations in terms of funding that might influence the final that might influence the design of the adaptation so you're making the person aware of what your limitations are what the limitations of what you're able to offer um, as I say you've then got what you're going to be doing in terms of the action that you need to do so you need to identify why they've approached you who else is involved in that situation are the carers involved that's really important for information because you might need to involve those people in the design um, later on in, in the process. You're looking at any resource uh, limitations that might be within your practice setting um, and you're thinking and you're looking actually identifying how collaborative relationship that you have with the person is going to hopefully improve that situation. So the outcome there is either you're going to accept that referral um, or and you're going to be kind of documenting that key information that you're going to be using when you go out to visit the person. And you're going to be obviously documenting consent. So that's sub phase zero. So it's very much that initial contact. Is this the right approach for you? Because um, you don't want to be wasting their time and your time. So sub phase zero is often when you're going out to meet the person for the first time and you're getting a sense of actually what is it that they're reporting that they're finding difficult and what is it that they're um, wanting to address through um, having their home modified. So it's about being really clear right at the start about, okay, tell me what it is that you're having difficulty doing you're not what you're not trying to find out why you're just wanting to understand right tell me what it is that you're having difficulty doing what is it that you want to be able to do that you're not able to do in your home environment so you're really focusing down early on um, before you start looking at the home environment you're really tuning in often what what I found is that you'll perhaps get a referral from a carer or you've gone in with an assumption that oh it's a bathroom modification and actually when you start speaking to them you realize actually that's not really what they're wanting so this is about really focusing in on right okay before we start looking around your home tell me what it is that you're wanting to do the occupations that you want to focus on if they've got a list of um, different things that they want to be able to do, then obviously you, you might need to prioritise. So in terms of the action needs, you might need, if there's lots of things that's going on, you might be having to prioritise. And again, in terms of outcome, you, you're identifying what it is that they're, you know, wanting to prioritise. 
or it could be that actually in that initial conversation again you might be thinking actually we need to refer you on to alternative um, services so at the bottom here we've got some tools that might be able to help you focus in on that so we've got things like uh, the Copham um, and some Moho tools there as well that you might that would enable you to collect that initial information about right okay tell me what it is that we're, we're trying to do so once we've established right okay you want you know this is what you're wanting to do then you're looking at okay let's analyze what it is that's going on in terms of the person the environment and the task so you're kind of using that your PEO theory about understanding and often this is where we're observing the person in their environment and trying to get an understanding of okay what is it about this environment what is it about the person that is um, a barrier or is preventing them from doing what they're wanting to do so in terms of action needed you're looking at what the person's not performing well um, you're looking at what they, they are doing well you're thinking about right what is it in the environment that's stopping them participating or what's impacting on their performance again in terms of outcome you're doing your performance analysis on your documenting that you're identifying the elements that are causing the impact on occupational performance and you're documenting that the reason you're documenting that is because when you're thinking about the design in subphase four and you're doing you know you might have various designs you're going back and thinking right okay does this design kind of address the issues that we've identified when we did that um, analysis of the person in their environment and again I've got some tools down here that perhaps helps us do some of that assessment um, some of these I'm sure will be familiar with you I quite like the the rice scale um, and the housing enabler um, is quite good in terms of an objective assessment um, what I haven't got down here is uh, Tammy Applin has in Australia has done some nice stuff in terms of um, the person's perspective of the home environment so that's sub phase two so that is all part of the the assessment we then come on to intervention planning so this is about okay we've identified in the previous phase around what it is that is causing the barrier um, you know in terms of the environment and what we're doing in some phase three is being really clear about what our goals are for the adaptation and what I've done here is are we doing an ad adaptation to restore their occupational performance participation are we trying just to maintain their performance participation or are we trying to develop skills um, so that they're able to perform or participate in a new occupation the reason that I've kind of separated these things out is because what you do later on is going to be quite different so if you are uh, just maintaining somebody's um, performance then you know you, you're just maintaining but actually if you're if you're working with uh, a young man perhaps he's had a spinal injury he's moving away from the home for the first time and actually you're doing a kitchen adaptation so that, that for the first time they're actually able to do their own cooking well actually later on down the line it's not just about installing the adaptation I'm going to I'm going to need to do some work with this guy so that he can actually develop the skills to be actually able to use the the modification that I've installed also developing being very clear about what the goals are enables you to say right okay you're when you get to the final phase and you're doing the re-evaluation if you've been really clear early on about what the goals have been in this phase you're able to revisit and say right okay you know when we started out on this journey we developed your goals have we achieved what you know we set out to achieve so that's why I've been quite specific about whether we're, we're restoring, whether we're just maintaining um, or whether we're developing some risk skills. Again, it goes through kind of the action, need, what action you need to take. So you need to identify 
what the person's goals are. And I think sometimes it's quite useful to have the goals in the language the person uses, because um, often their language is very different to perhaps how the, the language we would use as occupational therapists to develop goals. Okay. What you're also doing here is you're identifying terms of, okay, what the design design requirements are in terms of um, of the, the design that you'll come to put together for the person. Um, um, and so the outcome here is you've got your goals, you've got the design requirements um, that somebody might need. Um, so the design requirements are things that you will be, when you're working with your architect, you'd be saying, you know, this person needs X amount of space to be able to maneuver their wheelchair. They need things at this height. They need four seats with these types of features so that they can turn them on and off. So those are the things that you need to think about in terms of the design requirements. And you're linking that back to phase two and when you're looking at what the barriers are, what their strength, the person's strengths are, where they're having difficulties um, in terms of their performance. Okay. So subphase four is a feasibility study. So here you're working with your architect or even yourself in terms of depending what level of skill you are, but you're looking at the various different types of design options. Um, that because often there is more than one solution to a problem. Um, so you're looking and you're presenting the various design options that there, there might be and you're looking about, OK, this is a particular solution. Does that meet what we need in terms of the issues that the, we've identified in the earlier phases? Often what will come in here is funding. So in the UK, we do have um, a um, statutory grant for funding um, adaptations. It is means tested um, and there's quite strict criteria about what isn't, what isn't funded. Those are the factors that will have an impact on the different types of solutions um, that you can offer somebody. Um, so this is where the funding side comes in, in terms of, you know, what options you've got available to you. Um, so yeah, you're doing your feasibility uh, hey, study, you're looking at... Can I, Hiya. I hate to interrupt you, but it's um, right. we were just kind of discussing something similar in, the eva in our evaluation committee. So can you make recommendations even though they might not have official funding for it. Would you still make the recommendation? No. Yeah, this is this. Yeah, and and this is often what happens in the UK. You have you, I, personally, I think you have an obligation to tell the person all the options that are available. So when I went into somebody, I would say these are your options. If we're looking, if you're looking to get statutory funding, so if you guys, in terms of um, your insurance, doesn't always come cover modifications, does it? No. In the US, yeah. But this is what you were saying is certainly in the UK. What I would be saying, right? These are the options that you have got. Option A is this, option B is this, option C is that. If you are wanting statutory funding, we can only get statutory funding for option B. Um, and it's about being open and transparent because people might say, well, actually, I'd rather pay for it myself and have it look a certain way. Or they'll say, and and depending on your local authority, um, um, some local authorities will will provide the fund, what they would have funded for X scheme and people will then top up for a different scheme. But I, I think you have, you have to lay out the different options and it's then up it's to the person. Up. Yeah. Um, 
because otherwise if you know that there, there are other options available and you're keeping that information away from the person because you don't want that often what happens in the uk is is we don't want conflict with clients and um, that we're working with and we're worried that if we say oh we could do this but you won't get funding we're worried about the repercussions but i think if you're if you're transparent with people and say you could go for option a but you won't get statutory funding um and then people can make an informed decision about how they want you know the approach that they want to take does that make sense that makes sense but my other question is they're just starting i mean we're this is such an emerging field in the u.s it's not even yeah. funny but um they're, we're just starting to get um funding for occupational therapy services for home modifications through insurance it's just starting yeah. just starting to identify that as a need so yeah. i'm wondering if you say in the uk you you say okay these are my recommendations this is covered by statutory funding this is not yeah. do your recommendations that you make that are not covered by statutory funding i assume you're funded for the ot evaluation right oh this is where it gets real this it's it's um oh this is where it gets really muddy ah uh, right okay in in and the four because in the uk we we we've got scotland wales northern ireland and they all have different pieces of legislation so i can only really speak with any authority in in um england so what happens in england is that everybody has a right to an assessment um and from that assessment we will make recommendations um there is a grant called the disabled facilities grant that is held by our housing that's held by the housing um authority um and all we do as occupational therapists is make recommendations about what is necessary and appropriate and the legislation says that the housing have to consult with the welfare authority which is what they're doing when they when they're liaising with an occupational therapist they the housing can decline a recommendation from an OT if they don't think it's reasonable or practicable. So we might say something is necessary and appropriate, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they, they will fund the adaptation if they don't see it as reasonable or practicable. What you have to do is, and sometimes they do challenge um, our recommendations and rightly so because at the end of the day this is this is public money um, and you know we have to ensure that what we're recommending is cost effective what we have to get much better at is looking at kind of the cost benefits of doing an adaptation one of where we often and where you'll often get issues is around is particularly around children's adaptations um, because they'll always spatially want to do the minimum and it's about arguing that children grow um, and we you know yes the child at this particular moment in time doesn't need x amount of space but they're going to grow and they're going to need bigger facilities and it's about us being able to argue that there might be situations as well where we're recommending a more costly solution but the savings in terms of care costs are um, better so um, a good example is um, we call it ceiling track hoists i'm not quite sure what you call them in the states where you've got the the, the rather than having a mobile hoist we have ceiling track hoist which is often a more expensive solution but you with but there is a cost benefit because often with ceiling track hoist you you only need one carer where with a, with a mobile hoist you usually need two carers 
So often what you can argue is, yes, this is a more costly solution, but the cost benefits in terms of reduction in paid carers is X amount. And this is where in terms of working with insurance companies, this is where you've got to look at, you know, yes, you're modifying the home. Yes, it's very costly, but actually it saves X amount in terms of um, um, paid carers. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you typically um, document like reduced attendant care or that sort of thing and specific numbers for the reduction in attendant? Um, each each local authority, each OT department will work very differently. Um, and I think this is something that we will need to get better at and we are getting better at in terms of being able to articulate that information in a way that's meaningful to our housing colleagues because um, our housing colleagues aren't necessarily bothered about the savings to the social care budget because that's not their budget they're not bothered about saving money because however in the UK we're moving towards much more integrated services so at the moment in the UK our National Health Service sits very separate from our social care service. Um, so our national service, the National Health Service is um, funded nationally, whereas social care is funded locally. But the two are coming together and there is this recognition and this is where housing adapt modifications are, are fantastic because potentially yes if we spend money on an adaptation that looks costly in terms of what you save over the years it, you get your money back in so quickly so quickly um and we're getting better at documenting that um but we don't have any standardized tools at the moment that um that that actually captures that our, my colleagues in independent practice where they're looking at um, say if it's a medical legal case um, where they're looking at the kind of benefits over a lifetime if you do a modification and care costs I think they're much better um, but I think it's about us as occupational therapists not being precious about this information and being able to articulate it in a way to those people and rightly so because at the end of the day we're all paying for insurance one way or another exactly. and you want to make sure that you know whatever you're recommending is is spending that insurance money rightly because otherwise it's just going to bump everybody's premiums up um but it's about being able to collect that information. You know, if we do the modification in this way, it's going to cost X amount. However, the return in reduction of care costs is X amount. And they're simple calculations to make um, in terms of what you, you know, what you'd save in, you know, carers coming in. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. In fact, yeah. I'm reading it down yeah. right now. All right, okay. Oh God, don't quote me. Um, <laughs> right, sorry. I'll just, I'll, I'll sorry. I'll pick back up because I'm no times marching on. So yeah, so this is where feasibility. So you're looking at all the options. You're making it. You know, you're. And at the end of the day, if you're working with private, just like yourselves, you, you know, the person that you were working with may say, well, actually, I know that would be a better solution. But actually, I'm going to compromise and go for that solution because at the end of the day, that's all I can afford. And it's about making the person aware of what the pros and cons are if they do go for an alternative solution. Um, so that's all about phase four. And then phase five is this is this. I, I We put this in because it's about. If you know, once you come up with the final design is getting agreement that the person really understands that that design that they're going for is going to be what they're what they're wanting so does that design actually provide the solution that that we identified being an issue earlier on in 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 phase 
um, two and three. You know, do the design details, provide the person with all that information that they need to say, yes, come on site, start ripping my walls down, start modifying my home. Um, and then goes through the action that you need to take. Um, the other important thing I think I've got here as well is that you've also identified and made it really clear about what you're not going to be able to achieve through the home modification. So if you had to, if you have had to compromise, that everybody is really aware of that, um, because I think often what can happen at the end, you install the adaptation, and the person says, well you know, you never said X, Y, and Z. So this is where you've been open and transparent about, well, actually, you know, we're not going to be able to achieve X, Y, and Z, um, but we are going to be able to do and, and achieve a lot of what, you know, the issues were. Um, and really importantly is that you've documented that the person is happy to uh, go ahead with um, the adaptation. And then intervention implementation, because often, Obviously, unless you are builders and plumbers, you're not actually going to install the adaptation, but you've got a really important role in terms of, you know, the inter the adaptation, the modification going in and that intervention implementation, I've called it here. And this, this covers phases six and seven. So often what you'll be involved in is supporting and coordinating coordinating the procurement of the home modification often you'll be the conduit between the builder the architect and the person often what I've tended to find is that OTs are very good at explaining to um, the people that we work with what the builder is going on about or the architect when they're going to the technical bits and pieces so I think we tend to have kind of an advocacy role there um, but what's really important is, is you are perhaps asking the builder what information that they need to be able to get on to do the job. Um, so if they need information about, you know, if there's particular products that you're wanting, they may need that information before they go on site. And that, you know, that information is really important because what you don't want to be doing is that they've been on site for, you know, four or five weeks. And then they're ringing you up saying, well, you know, what sink um, or what faucets do you want? And it takes another four weeks for that product to come. So this is why we've got this um, phase in is that you are saying to the builder, what what information do you need to be able to get on site to do what you need to be able to do? Have I given you all the information that you need? And also working with the person, the older disabled person or the carers and, and saying, actually, what ongoing support are you going to need um, during that construction of, of the adaptation? Sometimes with major works, you might be looking at having to get the person into respite care for a short period of time. So it's looking at, you know, although you're not putting in the adaptation, you've still got a really important role in terms of applying for funding. Um, if you're applying for insurance funding, et cetera, you might be involved in writing reports for that. You might be providing plans and specification product information, health and safety information that the builder needs to be aware of. So if you've got somebody with respiratory uh, conditions, are you, has the builder got all the right information that they need? Um, um, and also agreeing with the person and the builder, what support you're gonna offer during the construction. So that's sub phase six. And can I just break in real uh, quick, yeah. Again, Rachel? I'm yeah. sorry, I don't want to make it too long. One thing, um, you said you you went back to the materials that should be used, and I yeah. know, like when you're working for the government or something, you don't really have a big, yeah. you know, have a real hand in that. But yeah. as a business owner, when I work with, um, I I own a construction business, then I own a consulting business, and when I'm the OT for a consulting on a um, construction project what I typically yeah. do is you know we discuss it with the family and with the builder but yeah. basically anything that needs to be specific for the disability um, like yeah. I think you know shallow basin plumbed in the back uh, specific faucets even grab bars yeah. I provide those as yeah the I order it, I provide it 
that's part of my role in the whole construction project is providing yeah. those things that are specific for the um, yeah. disability, which is nice because then I know they get what they need. And of course, you have yeah. to order it in a timely manner. But also, it's a way for me to make money, you know, to support my business and to support yeah. me. And I think that's yeah. one thing that sometimes OTs miss out on. Yeah, certainly in the UK, again, um, housing tend to take charge about what products, but this is where, you know, a grab rail is not just grab rail, is it? Often it's about thinking about what texture it needs to be. And yeah. sometimes it's being color. Certainly in the U yeah, exactly. And I think sometimes in the UK, it's about that, th you know, often the OT will just say, oh, they just need a wet room. Well, you know, you need to think about the design of products because that could make the difference between, you know, like you say, the shape of the faucet is going to make the difference between somebody being independent and somebody not being independent. And yes, you might not be able to say they need X product, but you can give enough detail and specification about a product that means that there is only one product that's going to kind of meet the need. Um, and I think that is about, and it's just about occupational therapists recognizing that, that you know, you have a responsibility to really think about every aspect of what you're installing, because as I say, you know, it's that level of detail that makes the difference between a modification working all right and a modification being perfect but that comes down to have you done a really good assessment so that you know what no, that no. person's capabilities are you know have you done that really detailed assessment right at the beginning so that you've got all that information so that you're not having to go back in and do an assessment later on when they're on you know when the builder's on site and you're thinking about you need to you know you need that depth of assessment early on um does that make sense? Yeah. Right. So just sense, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, so subphase seven is obviously when everything's going in, and um, what you may be doing here is um, kind of the final detailing. So it may just be offering ongoing support but it's also like you, you do Karen it may be you, you're actually providing some of those and supplying some of those um, um, products that perhaps the builder isn't supplying and being involved in the final positioning of tools so the things like the grab rails the kind of personalizing the the final details is involved in that final sub phase and then hopefully you've got your modification is installed. And then finally, you'd be glad to hear marching on is we've got the re-evaluation or what we call the evaluation site. So this is where you're going back and you're checking, is it operating in the right way? And does the person know how to maintain the thing that you've installed? So, you know, you're thinking about, right, OK, given what our goals were right at the beginning of this process, is the adapt is the modification in the way that it's intending to do? Has have we achieved the goals that we identified earlier on in 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 the um, process? And really importantly, as a practitioner, what can you learn? What can the building, the architect, what can you learn from what you have done that's going to then make a difference? to your next project so what can you learn reflecting on your practice and what you've done um, 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 with in terms of what you've installed so in terms of the action needed it may be that once it's installed the person needs some training um, they may need a little bit of orientating and, and rehab so that they can actually use the adaptation so you know if you think about it, you know, if you've taken the bath out and you've installed a wet room, a level access shower, they might need, you know, do they know how to work the shower? Do they know how, to, you know, where to position themselves and, you know, um, what, what they're doing? So it's just about thinking about, OK, you know, we've got it installed. That's not the end job. What else do I need to do? So I know that that person's making the best use out of that, that modification. 
as I said, do they need any support and training around how to maintain the adaptation? Um, and in terms of your professional evaluation, the action that you need to take, which is that, um, what can you learn for next time? And again, we've got the outcomes and then some tools that might assist you in doing that evaluation. Okay. I'm really wary of time. So just in terms of implications for practice, um, I did do a proof of concept. So I worked with um, some occupational therapists in London and um, this probably doesn't make any sense, but I just want to highlight something to you was what was really interesting is in terms of we mapped out what they did and what was really interesting is this here, I hope you can see my cursor going around here. This was this bit here was just about that initial, you know, the client contacting them and the OT getting ready to go out. But this was the initial assessment. And what was really interesting was that they realised how much that they were doing in terms of the home modification process within that visit and often this visit would only be about an hour um so with an hour they were you know they were doing what's your problem you know what are your goals let's have a look at you using your home environment to look at what the problems are and what they kind of realized was that they were trying to fit in too much in this hour visit which meant that they weren't collecting all the information, which meant that they were wasting time because they were having to go back in these later phases to get information that they should have been collecting earlier on. So I just wanted to kind of show you that in terms of proof of concept. But the feedback that they, I got from them using this, um, this protocol was that they felt it gave them a step-by-step -step guide to what they did in the home modification process because it was person-centered, because at all times it was about involving the person and having the person's goals in terms of modifying the environment, that they felt for the first time that they really um, had the person at the center of the process. And one of the things that they said was, you know, they really sat down and said, you know, what are your goals? And often they wouldn't kind of, you know, they thought they were doing that, because they were going and they were making recommendations for the adaptations or the modifications. But they really sat and they actually said, you know, what are we what are we trying to achieve? What are your goals for this um, adaptation? Um, it enabled them to think that, that, so this was a group of occupational therapists that were working with housing colleagues and architects, and it helped them understand, that, help them to understand what their role was within that wider housing team and for the first time they felt that they actually were able to kind of gain a little bit of not that they didn't have respect from their architects and housing colleagues but because they were able to what their role was and that they were able to use language that was familiar to, to their housing colleagues um, they felt that they gained respect because they could kind of explain why they were, um, you know, very passionate about where a grab rail uh, fitted. So, um, um, yeah, they felt that it, they gained respect from their housing team because they could kind of illustrate and explain what the role was in, in the process. So in terms of how I see this tool being used is in terms of, I think it's a useful training tool because I think it kind of outlines for students and for new staff working in this field of practice actually what's involved. Um, and it's a framework for thinking about actually what your role is in supporting the design and construction uh, of adaptations. And I think it's just a refresher for actually making visible what it is that you're doing. Um, I think it's also a useful tool because it kind of demonstrates the complexity of what we do. And certainly for us, when we're often working with commissioners who are commissioning occupational therapists to do this work, it just kind of is a useful tool to kind of say, look, this is what you're paying for. It is really complex what we do. Um, 
and but this is why we're doing what we're doing and this is why it takes so long to do that initial visit um, and it just values it justifies the value that we have in all aspects of design and supporting the construction of the modification in the UK often what can happen is that we just get involved in person making recommendations that they need an adaptation and then it can be quite variable as to what involvement we might then have in the other aspects of um, the design and construction of the adaptation. Um, in terms of um, improving services so I see it as a tool for service improvement because I think you know it's an audit trail in terms of what you what you are doing and what you are going to do and what you have done by having a clear process it's hopefully a much more efficient way of managing your cases because it's getting you to collect information when you should be collecting it you're not having to to and fro um you know you're not having the builder ringing you up saying oh you know where do you want this put in because hopefully you've thought about that in your design requirements um, for you, those of you who um, supervise staff, then hopefully it's a supervision tool because you can make sure that you're, you know, that staff are following the right process. And if problems have arisen, because problems do arise, we don't live in a perfect world, hopefully by having the process, you can perhaps identify where issues have arisen. If you then find a pattern, it then helps you to kind of identify, right, okay, we need to do something about that. I've put here as well, in the UK, I don't know about the States, but uh, in the UK, we can have cases that are passed between occupational therapy teams. So this might be where you've had somebody that's been in um, hospital with an acute um, episode of illness, then then move out into the um, community, and then the case is picked up by another occupational therapist. Often what will happen in those cases is the person, poor person has to get assessed again and again and again. And hopefully what this process does is, is that the information moves with the person rather than the person having to kind of start again from scratch. Um, in terms of occupational therapy practice, hopefully it begins to identify more research uh, in the process where we need more outcome measures, what kind of outcome measures we need to be using. Hopefully it begins to identify some of the tools that we need to support practice. Um, I'm just wary of the time, um, but what I have, I'll send round if you contact me is, um, I'm trying to develop some tools that get you to think about design requirements, um, and, and when you've got plans in front of you, a tool that helps you to evaluate the person to make sure that you've got the right uh, design. Um, I'm just wary of time, Karen, and whether rather than going through these next two slides, whether we just want to take some questions. Yeah, um, definitely. And keep us updated on your tools. And if it's all right with you, we're working on an evaluation tool ourselves. And I would love to send it your way and have. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Oh, good. Does anybody have any questions? I've just realized that that's my old um, email address. So I'm just going to put up my new mate, my proper email address and then um, so just bear with me that was very informative and the timeliness of you coming to speak I just can't even tell you what great timing it what well, it is because we are working on um, like I said developing an, an app right now for Hamoda right and then Ellie says maybe another night for question and answers because this was meaningful for Rachel and her work. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's fine. Yeah. I'd love to come back. Yeah. Yeah. I. I, I, I'll I, can, be... I can. Go ahead. I can talk for hours. I'm. I'm a typical Yorkshire person. I can talk for. <laughs> I can talk for hours. <laughs> 
I like that. <laughs> I'm going to pass out. I Ellie sent me the packets of information yeah. that you sent to her. So I'm going to be sending that out as well. And I would Fantastic. assume that people are going to want to have some questions for you once they can really examine it and you know, yeah. examine it a little bit. Well, Ellie, why don't we, yeah, just perhaps, I mean, <laughs> What a question answer session, but if people do, then I'm more than happy. This time of night is not too bad. Um, um, I am still awake, so that's something. Um, so I'm more Hi. than happy to come back to do Q and A session. Hey, hey, Rachel, it's Ellie. Hi, yeah. Um, so I, I instead of uh, having to field multiple emails, maybe asking the same questions, I think it might be good to. Give people a couple over the documents, process what you've, um, you know, shared with us tonight, and yeah. then organize our questions and then meet again. Um, oh, that'd be brilliant. Well, yeah, Ellie, that's fine. Because I know you had, you had said for your own research purposes and uh, that you, the question and answer and getting the feedback was really good for you. And, and yeah. I, I don't want you to feel like it's been a one sided, um, uh, exchange here oh no I wouldn't have thought of that anyway Ellie but yeah no if we can do yeah we'll we'll book something else in the diary then if you can send me some dates then we can do that perfect and then I'll also keep you updated as far as the evaluation committee goes and um, what we're doing and again any feedback we're gonna be, we will be doing I would imagine we're gonna be basing a lot of part of the evaluation at least if not all of it on your processes yeah um have you heard of idapt no i haven't Maybe right. Somebody else has. right has anybody else heard of idapt um idapt is a company in the uk that they have um let me just um they they have um can you still see my screen yes let me just go see if i can um so they are a company that um let me just i probably don't want the 3d version um so th they so this is um, a planning tool um, that is used by a lot of occupational therapists in the UK and our housing colleagues um, and it allows you to um, do your CAD drawings, it allows it will oh. um, do schedule of rates, it has um, products, bits and pieces um, in there. Um, so it may be worthwhile having a look at that. They have got a 3D, 3D version as well. Um, but so they have got a lot of products. Um, we can't see but they will we can only see the PowerPoint on your screen if you're showing it. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, I need to stop sharing, don't I? Let, no, oh, no, I don't you to be able to see whatever you're looking at, I would think. Um, Maybe. I think it's because I'm sure. Um, uh, let me just hold on, hold on. Right, okay. Right, sh right. is it come on now? Yes, yes. Yeah, so yeah. So this is IDAP Planner. Um, so it'll... Um, so you can use it as 2D, but it'll let you do your schedule of rates. Um, it's brilliant. So it might be worthwhile having a look at this. Definitely. Yeah, we were just talking about trying to find something like this. I assume that would work like on a, a tablet as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And the guys are really um philippa who runs the company with nigel they're they're married but they're, they're absolutely fantastic and they're um if you, yeah they're just they're absolutely brilliant and they'll they'll kind of you know adapt stuff as you you want it um but it's quite a nice visual tool um when you know 
when you're working with people just to kind of show them what 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 it's going to look like um but i would contact them to have a chat with them yeah that's it they obviously do an online demo um yeah it'd be nice to talk to them if they would want to work with us you know yeah as far as making that work and they, they'll session like this like i've done this evening they'll probably do a session with you to go through how to use it etc nice yeah thank you so much we were just talking That's about right. finding something like this we talk about yeah. design sorts of things it looks pretty easy is it pretty easy to use then as far as um i think it's i think if you guys are used to using technology then i don't think you'll have a problem um i think you'll be fine using it nice um but it, like i say what's really good is that you can it it will um it, it will do like do the costings and bits and pieces for you um yeah so i would i'd get in contact with them um and it's nigel and philippa burton who run the company um but they're they're really and they have been over to the states because i know because i came to an inclusive design conference probably about six or seven years ago now and they were over um oh nice and i know some of the australian ot's have looked at this as well nice yeah sorry i'm, I'm so it's I nice to I'm learn just... different things yeah is that okay then for now Yes, thank you so much, Rachel. I think was my was my sound dropping out during the session? Just a little bit when people were popping in and out. All oh, right, okay. So I do have a rather loud, booming Yorkshire accent. So hopefully, I, have, have people been able to understand what I've? Because like I said, I do have a strong regional accent. So hopefully, I've, people have been able to understand what I've been going on about. <laughs> I didn't have any trouble. Barbara says um, sound was perfect. Everybody's saying no problem. Francisco, loud. Oh, and fantastic! Clear. Yeah. Are you looking at kind of going international as a? Yeah. As... So this is what I'm. We just sort of started doing this just to get just to promote OT and home mods, just because it seems yeah. like everybody's looking to the builders for um, yeah, and not to us at all. So it's been really fun and it's been a great ride we've had you know we've the goal is to promote ot and to, to develop a lucrative business model because the funding just yeah. hasn't been there um yeah we're starting to see more funding we got uh and you know this is emerging here so um now some of the other some of the companies are some of the funding sources are asking for ot home evaluations but nobody knows where to find home mod ot's yeah. And so what we're finding is, so um, we just got a, we got a national contract to provide OTs um, for home modification evaluations throughout the country. And then we just were in the process of getting a contract in Philadelphia to provide the home, home modifications there. But I think what it boils down to is, um, you know, be, people being able to find us and by coming together like this people are beginning able to find us and we're yeah. starting to have a lot more strength as far as politically advocating for our profession and yeah. also vendors are happy to find us so yeah. what i'd like to do we just um picked I, we just picked up a whole bunch of ot's out of australia and i'd love to like cooperate with england too and have people you know there'd have to be a lead ot in each each country but yeah. to help develop the contracts there and and help OTs to be found, the home mod OTs just to be found by people who need us. Because I would imagine the Australians would be really interested because their health and social care system has is going and has gone through a massive change. So they are moving to much more of a model that as you're talking about in terms of these types of contracts here in the UK we've still got the we've got a welfare system um, but that's not to say it ain't going to change in the next 15 
20 years um, but I would imagine that the Australian guys will be kind of their model kind of will I, I can I mean I don't know if there's any Australians there but I would imagine there'll be some kind of similarities in terms of how they're now working um, in in terms of their nationalised insurance um, scheme for those with long-term conditions because um, if you come across the um, home mods clearing house in Australia I think that's where I, uh, I put a note about today's meeting all oh, right okay because I'm part of their listserv and it it's very active yes yeah yeah Sarah Painter says that's how she heard about it thank you Sarah for coming by the way and everyone else but I, I just feel like we really just need to spotlight our profession and if we can it's working here in the United States we're starting to get a lot more traction than we could have t gotten as individuals working as a group and yeah. so hopefully that that can spread around a bit yeah we could do with like an international conference couldn't we that would be great fun so we'll start working on that. Right, okay. I'll come. <laughs> good, good. That'll be great. Or maybe we'll all come visit you. Yeah. Right, I'm going to leave you because it's nearly one o'clock here in the UK and I, I need to go to bed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel, for staying up late. Oh it's, been my, it's, oh, it's been my pleasure. And Ellie, just send me some dates through when I can do a bit of a Q&A session. Will do. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, my hey, pleasure. Good night, everyone. Take real care. Quick, Rachel, I'm going to send you stuff oh, yeah. from the evaluation committee, too. And just when you have time to look at it, take a look at it and send it back. You know, any comments? I will. Yeah, I will do. That's brilliant. Thanks. Look forward to receiving it. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Goodbye. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I know this has been a great um, presentation. I'm going to do my best to get this all reformatted so I can upload it and get it on for uh, for everybody to see and to listen to again because there's so much to it. Ellie was nice enough to get us all the handouts so I'll also try to get the handouts out as well.